That's another Saturday morning. That means it's time for the Cummins Real Estate Group show with Michelle Cummins and myself, Curtis Pope. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning, Curtis. How are you? I'm doing good, although I have to admit, uh, you're you're all dressed all Christmassy, and you've got your nails all done. I'm sitting here in my coat because it is freezing in this control room this morning. Oh, my goodness. Do you have the AC on? Maybe that's it. Did I turn the wrong thing on this morning? That's a possibility. It is the middle of winter. There is snow in the air. I know. I could, you know, you may, maybe you're right. Maybe I did hit the wrong switch. That's quite possible. Is your window open, maybe? No, the windows don't open. That's right, they don't. Yeah, it's been, no, I know. I, how, could, I could scratch that off the list. I haven't done that wrong. I haven't been in the studio in so long. I forgot your windows don't. That's open. true. Yeah, no, <laughs> windows don't open in, in in studios. Generally, they don't open because they want soundproofing and whatnot. And plus, if we could open the window, we'd be throwing stuff at people and things like that. You know what radio people are like. <laughs> That's not good. Yeah, it, it's just a lawsuit waiting to happen. So it's better this way. I have to ask you. Last week, I had. Um, a, I went. We went out for chai tea, and I went out for chai tea with a friend. And I tried this new place in Abbotsford. Have you ever tried it? It's on the. It's corn. It's a cafe, but I thought it was coffee. Actually, we thought we were going for coffee, but oh my gosh, we had the best chai tea ever, and this butter chicken wrap, and it was just amazing. Like grilled, it was, but I, it was so unexpected. It's called. High Walla of London. Uh, you know, I've seen that. I've driven by it. Uh, it's right in the corner of South Fraser Way and uh, and Gladwin. Uh, but yeah. I haven't uh, actually uh, set foot in it yet. Oh my gosh, it's such good Indian food and a, just a billion different flavored chais. Mm. The best I've ever had. And I love chai. I like chai tea as well, so I, I, I would like that. It's so good. I had the vanilla chai, but they have so many unique flavors that I have to now go in and try every different flavor. I'm going to actually have a group uh, lunch there in January. And uh, because they, it's the, the atmosphere is amazing. It's two stories high, really high ceiling windows, the lights, the fixtures, the way they do it all there. It's amazing. And the views of Mount Baker and everything are just outstanding. Uh, we sat up on the topper level. T- topper level. <laughs> the topper level. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, Curtis, what are things are you going to do now that we're like two weeks, no, less than two weeks away from Christmas now? Oh, my gosh. We're, we're like so eight close. days away. No, it's seven days. I'm doing the math here. My math is not good. We're like a week away. So a week ago, we were two weeks away from Christmas. That's how fast my life is. Just blink of the eye. I hear you. But I had time to put on an ugly sweater. <laughs> yeah, no, I, well, you see, again, I... I'm just wearing my coat right now. I'm not looking all that Christmassy. I am wearing my Vancouver Canucks hat, but uh, uh, yeah, no, nothing, nothing Christmassy. Well, kudos for that. Not even like a Christmas pin in the in the Canucks hat. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm feeling very unChristmassy. I'm not sure what's wrong with me. Maybe I should have painted my face green and come in as the Grinch. I don't know. Yeah, probably that's a good idea. Well, I could share my little light lights here with you, but you know, you're you're. You're in the studio, and I'm locked out. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I, ho- I totally hear you. <laughs> so uh, traditionally, Richard and I love going to art maps during the Christmas holiday time. I mean, we love – it's just it, it just becomes this Christmas. It's huge. We spend at least four hours walking through with a hot coffee and thermos, and we just – I always come out with some amazing stuff. At, do you ever go there for Christmas time? Yeah, you know what? That used to be a, a big part of uh, when I was a kid. My mom always went to art naps, well, oh. year-round. Uh, the one uh, almost in, in Steveston where, when you know, it's not there anymore, but when I was growing up, I used to always go there, yeah. Oh, that I've never been to that one. I always go to the one on like the Sterling border mm-hmm. in between. But uh, and the other traditional thing I love doing, we don't do it every year, but maybe every three years. And whenever we have guests over, we always bring them to the Capilano with the Christmas lights, Capilano Bridge. Yep. Suspension Bridge. That is fun. And the Vancouver Christmas Market is a blast. You know, the funny thing is, I've, uh, you know, born and raised in Vancouver. Well, born in Vancouver, raised in Richmond. Uh, I have never been to the Capilano Suspension Bridge. Are you serious? <laughs> it's one of those things because, you know, it's there and it's the touristy thing and, you know, it's always there. I can always go there. I just never have. See, that's the thing is we live in one of the most touristy places. That's so great. We have so many places and things to do all year round for every season. And yes, yet we don't enjoy what's in our own backyard. Okay, you have to make me promise that you and your family will go to Capilano 
I'd like to say this season, well, during New Year's, it's so fantastic. You, the, the bridges and the walk paths and so oh, You've got to go. It's so fun. Yeah, no, I'm. I'm. I'm I keep saying we're going to go there one day, but we just we haven't. And in fact, I think, I think Cody's been there, and maybe even Cassidy too for like school field trips and stuff. But uh, no, I I have never. I know Kelly's been there. I've just never been there. Ah, oh, fun. I've driven by it a number of times, just never and, gone in. <laughs> and you got to get some divinity fudge from the little fudge store. Like they have a little market there. Okay, that's always nice. <laughs> that's my like little tradition. What traditions do you have? Around Christmas time, yeah. um, spending a lot of money. Um, oh, wait a minute. No, that's not really a tradition. That's just a cause and effect. Um, yeah, you know, we, we my, my dad has uh, always made uh, homemade chocolates around Christmas time. Oh, uh, nice. So he's always spent a lot of time at Christmas time making that, and he sort of passed it on to me a little bit, uh, not so much. But now he's teaching, you know, the grandkids how to make them. He's just kind of skipping me and my brother. Oh, they're useless. I'll teach the grandkids how to make these things. Uh, milk so, chocolate or dark chocolate? Or uh, you know, you know, milk chocolate, dark chocolate. He makes, um, you know, these, like, little peanut butter things. He makes, uh, you know, peanut clusters. Oh, he yeah. makes all kinds of stuff, uh, and, uh, and and they're really good, you know, and it, and it keeps him out of trouble. <laughs> So that's one oh, that family tradition sense. we have. And, and, you know, one of them has always been, uh, you know, not that we always got a ton of it, especially growing up in Lower Mainland, but, you know, the family would go for a walk with that first snowfall uh-huh. when, when the snow's coming down, things like that. So, you know, little things like that, um, watching certain Christmas movies every year. You know, I know a lot of people have that tradition. That's kind of one of the things we do as well. What's a couple of your go-to Christmas movies you watch every year? Well, my daughter's favorite movie of all time is Elf with Will Ferrell. Which is a good one. Um, yeah. I love uh, A Christmas Story. Yes, you um, shoot your eye out. Yeah, and the whole family love The Grinch. I, I knew that was going to be one of yours. And, of course, Christmas <laughs> Vacation is classic, too. Every dad can relate to Clark Griswold. So true. Those are great ones. And I know you as a movie fan. I know, well, I know your, your husband's a big fan of It's a Wonderful Life. Oh yes, we. Uh, I love that one too. We usually watch the black and white and the colored version. So we'll watch one around Christmas, usually Christmas Eve sometimes, and then like New Year's, we'll watch the other one as well. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. I, I I usually watch that at some point as well. Um, you know, because it is a, a classic. Okay, how about the one with Bo and Lou Duke from the Dukes of Hazard? They were in one that was actually filmed in Vancouver and the surrounding areas. And it's called um, Christmas Comes to Willow Creek. I don't believe I have seen that one. We just watched that actually last night. Hmm. In our, in our, yeah, <laughs> we just watched it last night. We usually watch that one once a year, too. You got you to gotta check that one out. It's very 80s, but uh, it's, it's, it's John Schneider and Tom Wolpat. Yeah, it's boys. Bo and Luke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I mean, well, I always, the, the big battle in my house is between me, my, you know, my boys and, 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 and Kelly is we like to watch Die Hard. And Kelly's like, this is not a Christmas movie. I'm like, it takes place at Christmas. It's a dad trying to get back with his family at all costs. It's a Christmas movie. Sounds Christmassy to me. I've never seen it. But... You've never seen Die Hard with Bruce Willis? Nope. <laughs> How? <laughs> Surprising things do happen. <laughs> I tell you. I, 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 well, you know, another one that's technically a Christmas movie is, is the original Lethal Weapon. Oh, really? It takes place at Christmas time. I'm trying to think if I've ever seen that one. Yeah, I it's, thought I did, but yeah, that hmm. one takes place at Christmas time too. At one point, uh, if memory uh, serves, Mel Gibson's trying to uh, buy a Christmas tree from drug dealers. Well, that sounds pretty Christmassy. And he takes them down because he's a cop, right? So that's the whole bust. And yeah, it's yeah, it's Mel Gibson. <laughs> it's Lethal Weapon. It started the buddy cop movies. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I'll have to have that one on my list. There you go. A couple of free to, a couple of action movies that are loosely around Christmas to watch. So, uh, what, one topic I wanted to talk about before we um, head off to a little uh, break here is some news about BC and how they want everyone's opinion about making buildings more accessible for everyone. I don't know about you, but I do know some people personally that, you know, are in wheelchairs or with walkers and, and they need, I have clients and family and friends, and they need the accessibility. And there's a lot of buildings that 
don't have that. So the government's asking the public to fill out an online survey to help guide changes to the building code. And there's a couple stories. So uh, somebody named Dominic Jacobs, so she can't get into her Vancouver Island condo using the front entrance without someone to hold the door for her. That would be pretty difficult, especially if, you, if you know, you, you, you're know you waiting around how long. Um, I can't imagine that. Uh, but, you know, stairways, door handler, handles, slippery floors. Uh, most disabled British Columbians have a list of things that make buildings inaccessible to them. And now the province wants to hear about them as it works to update the BC Building Code. So much like uh, where builders, and I was part of a task force many years ago, about getting into the building code um, for future aging so that when you buy a home you can actually age in it and when you do possibly need a walker or a wheelchair that you can still live in your same home and what's roughed into the home and what's already built there are the wider doorways uh, the, the the maybe the microwaves in the lower shelf uh, the support behind the walls where you might have to get get support you know by the toilet or, or the shower things like that that's already built um roughed into the, to the house. So the building code lays out the minimum safety requirements for new building construction, and it's updated every five years or so, and the province is putting a focus on accessibility for the next update in 2023. So Dan uh, Coulter, the MLA for Chilliwack, is the parliamentary secretary for accessibility, and he says his government's goal is to make BC the most accessible province, and for that, they need public health. He's launched an online survey, which British Columbians can use to lay out their priorities for building access. Accessible doors that are activated by push buttons make buildings more accessible for wheelchair users and also people who use canes or have limited use of their hands or arms. People can use their elbows or hips to push the button and open the door. Uh, So he says, I think we can use the survey and the input from British Columbians to help us shape the building code maybe in areas we never thought about. So accessibility is something culture thinks about every day because not just, I don't know if you knew, but uh, not just because it's uh, his job, but it's because he uses a wheelchair. Uh, he says he avoids all buildings that don't have an elevator and finds doors challenging as well. Uh, if they don't open automatically, the building you know, can be inaccessible to him. So there are places he may not be able to go because of that. Uh, Jacobs would like all new buildings to have automatic doors that are activated by the simple swipe of a key fob they should also slide open that's such a great idea i love that idea so there is lots of room for people to get through using the scooters and wheelchairs Uh, and um, the province they're wanting to offer grants to builders to help cover the cost uh, and make it easier to include during their construction so uh, buildings for everyone is what they want so that um, is a little news that please go on and find maybe if you google i don't have the link for you I'll put it actually on my homepage on my website uh, probably later today. But the province has a the survey, so I'll put the link there. But if you just search BC, um, you know, building codes accessibility survey, you probably will find it as well. But it will be on my homepage. All right, very cool. Well, if people want to go to that homepage and get some more information, what is that web address? MichelleCummins.ca. We're back with more right after this. Michelle Cummins and myself, Curtis Pope. All right, Michelle. So we uh, gave some news about accessibility there and how that could be changing in the province. What do we got for segment number two? Lots of exciting stuff ahead of us, Curtis. Exciting stuff. We're talking about termination of land use contracts. Well, termination, that sounds like a pretty, uh, you know, you know, important word. Yeah, termination, cut off. No more. Done you're done. With. You're 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 done. <laughs> it is so true, and so uh, that's the LUC. So a lot of people are like, "Oh, I want to buy an LUC lot. I want to buy an LUC lot." And we have a lot of that in Abbotsford. We have a lot of that in uh, quite a few municipalities. So what is a land use contract, and what does a termination of it mean? So the land use agreements between local governments and landowners. 
is going to be cut off. Municipalities and regional districts may enter into phased development agreements and housing agreements with landowners. In the past, they could enter into these land use contracts. And land use contracts were allowed in B.C. between 1971 and 1978. So between the time I and you were born. Hey, easy now. Don't give away too much. <laughs> As a form of site-specific contractual agreement between local governments and landowners, the intent was to allow more flexibility than traditional zoning. And these contracts were registered on land title, and they could be amended or discharged in the following ways. One, by bylaw at any time with the agreement of the local government and the landowner. And two, in the manner specified in the contract. So when the land use contract legislation was repealed in 1978, the existing contracts remained in place. However, no new contracts could be created after that time. Now, in 2014, which to me just seems like yesterday, but, you know, it's been a while now. So in 2014, the Local Government Act was changed to terminate all land use contracts by June 30th of 2024, giving local governments time to ensure that zoning and other bylaws are in place when the land use contracts terminate. The legislative change provides two termination options. The termination option that is used may have different requirements for matters such as public hearings, notification procedures, and filings related to land titles. If land, a building, or other structure is being lawfully used under the land use contract and the use would not apply under the new bylaw, the use may continue as non-conforming use. So that's a lot like... Be, you know, before the setbacks were in place, there's a lot of older homes that are legally non-conforming. When you hear that word, it's because they were built before the new bylaws came in place. But if they ever burned down or something happened to them, you would not be able to rebuild in the same location. Thus far, and you have to be careful as a buyer, you want to make sure that if you can't rebuild it in that location, can you build it within the lot uh, dimensions. You know, where would you uh, place it? What if it's a smaller lot? What if there's a creek running through it? What if it's against a major street, which has shorter setbacks than if you were adjacent to, let's say, just another property owner? But still, all of those things you have to really consider. Is it on septic and well? And where are those locations? How close can you be? All the stuff that you have to consider. So if you have an older house or you're thinking of buying a place that is legal, non-conforming, and the legal part just means it's allowed to be there, as long as it's there but you can't get out any new building permits you can't build you can't uh, you can't extend onto those properties if if the let's say deck uh gets destroyed in a fire or in another way you can't get a permit for another deck if it's still if it's within that um new zoning uh setback if it's in the that so anyways enough about that that's what that means certain conditions may apply so contact your local government for more details now an early termination option allows local governments to actually terminate land use contracts before the June 30th or 2022. So they all have to be ended by June 30th, 2024. But governments can start now to phase them out, uh, providing zoning is in place and certain requirement, requirements are met. Uh, so the city of Surrey plans to discharge land use contracts before the date. So they've been working on that. Um, and and they've been uh, working with landowners. They have to go through the neighborhood. Um, so let's, let's move on, though, to the relationship between LUCs and zoning. So if a property lies within a, the boundaries of an LUC, all land use regulations are prescribed in the LUC. Nevertheless, all properties in Surrey are assigned a zoning bylaw in its you know, if you care, 12,000 zone, uh, including those properties that are governed by LUC. So the zone assigned to a property that is regulated by an LUC is referred to as an underlying zone. Although all properties are regulated by LUCs have underlying zoning, the underlying zoning is to provide a general guide and has absolutely no effect on the land uses, density, or building siting. So once an LUC is terminated, the underlying zoning for the property automatically comes into effect. 
However, there are properties within some LUCs that do not correspond well to the underlying zoning that has been assigned to the property or that contain uses that are not equivalent to the uses or mix of uses contained within existing zones under that zoning bylaw. So in such instances, in conjunction with the termination of the LUC, these properties will be rezoned to either a more appropriate zone under zoning uh, under the zoning bylaw or to a site-specific comprehensive development. So definitely check in if you have a, a property that's within the LUC, if you bought it because it was an LUC lot, definitely keep in mind that that 2024 date is going to come up sooner than you think. If last week went away in the blink of my eye, so was the next couple of years. So <laughs> get, get prepared for that. And uh, so there's some frequently asked questions that I thought I would uh, bring up about that. So one is uh, for the properties with underlying single-family residential zones. Does the city require the consent of the owner of the property before an LUC can be terminated? Well, that's a no. Recent legislation allows the city council to terminate LUCs without the consent of the property owner. Will I be notified if city council proposes to terminate the LUC on the property on which any home is located? The answer is yes. Once a planning report with respect to the termination of the specific LUC has been presented to council, and once council has given first and second readings to the LUC termination bylaw, all property owners and tenants within the LUC to be t terminated will receive written notification by the city clerk. So all property owners and tenants of property within 100 meters of the LUC proposed to be terminated will also be notified by letter as well. Additionally, notifications will be placed in the local newspaper to appraise the general public of the proposed LUC termination. Uh, property owners and tenants within the LUC surrounded or surrounding property owners and tenants in the general public all have the right to make their opinions known either in person or in writing uh, at the public hearing um, held by the city. So the next question frequently asked, does the LUC termination mean that the city is going to redevelop my property and that I will have to move? Well, no. The city of Surrey has no intention of redeveloping your property and you can continue to reside in your current property as long as you wish. Now, these frequently asked questions are because Surrey has a very much an action plan to be terminating them prior to 2024. They do have more frequently asked questions than other municipalities when I was researching this. So this is where I got these uh, questions from, just so you know. So does the LUC termination mean that I will be required to make changes or upgrades to my existing dwelling so that it conforms to underlying zoning? No, you will not be required to make any changes or upgrades to bring your existing single-family dwelling in compliance with the underlying zone that will regulate your property once the termination of the LUC on your property comes into effect. Another question, will an LUC termination have an impact on the assessed value on my property and on my property taxes? No, you don't have to worry about that. It is not anticipated that terminating the LUC currently regulates your property will have any effect or impact on either the assessed value or the city property taxes. Does an LUC termination make it easier for a developer to redevelop my property? Well, no. Any developer who wants to develop your property will first have to obtain your consent to allow any redevelopment of your property to move forward. If the developer receives your consent, the developer will still have to submit a land development application to the city. So there you go. And when an LUC termination bylaw is adopted by council, does the underlying zoning come into effect immediately? The answer is no. LUC termination bylaws come into effect one year after they are adopted. During the one-year period, the rules and regulations of the LUC that is being terminated will continue to apply. So there are some of the questions that are frequent. Uh, if you have any more, you know, feel free to call an official about this, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I, I, I can connect you if you need that. Uh, but th there you go. That's a lot about, and that's happening everywhere in B.C. So not, you know, City ha of Surrey has this action plan, but many others um, are moving forward with that as well. So the City of Surrey seems to be really proactive in a lot of, a lot of things. Um, but, yeah, so there you go. Um, I have a quote of the week I would love to share. I would love to hear it. Do you know Benjamin Franklin? Not personally. Me either. But he has a good quote. 
that I like to live by. It's, <laughs> the quote is, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. And, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking at that this week. Actually, I'm meeting with friends this week, and we're gonna, I'm going to update my dream and vision board, and a couple of them don't have one, so they're going to create one. And it's been about 15 years since the last time, and that was the first time I have made one. Have you ever made one, Curtis? Not, uh, not completely, not so much, I guess, a vision board, but I've definitely written down, you know, on a piece of paper, you know, goals and aspirations and things like that. I have to tell you, my life, my whole trajectory, it changed once I really sat down and purposely made myself uh, this dream vision board. When I made my dream serious enough to go big and take the time to put it on the vision board, it's amazing. I didn't look at it every day, but just taking that time and that time to process and think about it and what do I want out of life and really putting it down, like taking that time, it's, it's like it solidified it for me. And I, I'm telling you, most things on my vision board have come true since I did that. And I think I did that way back in 2014, funny enough. I think oh, wow. that was the year I did it. And I pulled it out the other day, and I did the presentation on Zoom uh, for a group. And I, and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's amazing how most everything's come true. And I and and so I'm I'm ready to update it. And so I'm going to have fun and do that this week. And I encourage everyone to have a look at theirs and make one if you haven't. And in 2022, start really working on all the steps, stepping stones you need to make uh, your dreams come true and and your vision a reality. Absolutely. Sounds like a good plan to me. Now, of course, well, I guess we'll be off next week because it's going to be Christmas morning, and I don't particularly want to be here. I don't either. I like to be sitting by the tree. Yeah, yeah. I think that's my plan, too. Maybe a Christmas coffee or two. Mm-hmm. Or all maybe right. even three. So maybe we should wish everybody a happy Christmas, you know, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and all that right now. Yes. Merry Christmas, everyone. All right. Well, we were supposed to do that together. (laughs) Well, we're supposed to say it together. We can't. We're going to try to on the count of three, or we go on three, or just before three. Three, two, one. Merry Merry Christmas. Christmas. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that almost worked. Uh, (laughs) All right. We'll practice for next year. We will. We have a year to practice now. Uh, If people want more information about you and what you do as a realtor, where can they go? MichelleCummins.ca. And join us again next week when we will talk real estate in order to unlock your real estate potential on a show where real estate is maximized. Thanks for listening.